Hello and welcome to a very special episode of OT the Podcast. We're here to talk about one watch, uh, time and how to spend it. My name's Felix Schultz. And I'm Andy Green. Felix, uh, you are indeed correct. We have, well, we have two watches to talk about. Well, yeah, sure. You're, you're, you're technically right there, Andy. Technically, uh, technically, yeah. We have uh, an, an exciting announcement. Buzzing. Yes. Yes, you uh, tell everyone what I think they might already know based on the headline of this podcast. Based on the headline, OT the podcast is doing a watch. We are doing a watch with Anordain, Glasgow-based Anordain. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the first time we've collaborated on a watch. Might be the last, who knows? We are doing, uh, we're doing the new take on their Model 2, their famous Model 2, Felix. Yes. We have two dolls, white, off-white I should say, and pink. Yeah, we've got uh, we've got you know not to we've got a chat with Lewis Heath, the founder mm. of Anordain, coming up in literally like just a few seconds. Um, seconds so away. we get into all the details with him about how it happened, uh, you know what it's like, you know making a watch together from other sides of the world in the mm. in the middle of During a pandemic. pandemic. Yeah, um, and this isn't just about our watch. You're going to learn if you don't know about Anordain. This is mm. a great introduction to the brand. Um, you know they're pretty low volume. They've been around for a few years now, so. Odds are you've you've probably never seen one. Uh, They're very cool. They're, I mean, and that's you know not to not to. You're a long time owner. I mean, you've had one for <laughs> for, for yeah, quite a, a couple few years of now. Like since 2018, 2019. Yeah, you're an OG um, fan, so it's very cool to be working with them. It's a very cool. I mean, what makes these specials? Obviously, these dials. Uh, you know, hand enamel dials. Um, but yeah, it's a really interesting brand. Really cool to chat to um, chat to Lewis. Of course, Felix, this watch is available. There are thirty of each. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Twelve fifty Great British pounds plus uh, plus VAT or taxes. So yep. yeah, that's like twenty three hundred Aussie, sixteen seventeen hundred US. Very well priced. A lot of watch for the money, as they say. Huge amount. Um, huge and, amount of watch. But over at Anordain, check the notes uh, at our socials for for all the links and everything you need to know. And yeah, I think let's let's get on to Lewis, Andy. What do you reckon? Let's get him in. Let's just get him on, Lewis. Let's do it. Today's guest is a very special one for several reasons. Not only is Lewis Heath the founder of Anordain, a Scottish watch brand that makes incredible enamel dials at surprising prices, but he's also here to chat about the Anordain Times OT limited edition watch, which is pretty wild, Felix. Welcome to OT, Lewis. Hello. Hi, guys. It's great to have you here. Now that we've got a, a watch that we've created together, um, Lewis, I think it's probably time we we start with finding a little bit more about Anordain. So... Um, where did it all start? How did you end up starting a watch company? Um, that's a good question. Um, it was it was over, it was a long time ago. I think the idea came about, um, and it was it, the idea kind of sat with me for for about twenty years actually, until I would sort of left art college and then had some experience in in business, and then you know it, it was it was always sitting at the back of my mind as as the thing I kind of wanted to do. So two thousand fourteen, mm -hmm. I went down to the art college and um and talked to one of the the jewelry tutors and um and kind of put an ad up on the board to see if if there's anyone who's interested in uh, trying out enameling and we got we got one applicant and uh obviously he got the job um and that that's how it started we we kind of rented a studio and um Adam sat there and uh, tried to make enamel dials so that was and then, and then you know, three years later, we launched. But, um, but yeah, that was that was the beginning of it. But the, I mean, the idea behind the company was it, enamel was has always been the kind of fixation. But the idea is really about taking um, kind of different different um, creatives from different disciplines and and sort of mixing them together to see what you can come out with. Because I'd always always been fascinated by watches, but I, I felt that. And a lot of the design is quite derivative or, or there's there's a lot of kind of repeated ideas in there and and I think coming from a from a design background when I first got into watch actually the the only ones I liked was with like the max bill and um and the braun watch and that was after you know having quite a uh all, all the tutors I had at, at architecture school were, were very into their kind of 60s modernism so I that kind of brushed off on me and 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 everything else seemed kind of gaudy and excessive. So, um, you know, I've, I've changed since then, but uh, and now I like gaudy and excessive. But um, uh, it it is um, I came from that background, and I, and I realised there was a big disconnect from what you know a lot of people in the design community probably thought of as 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 being a a nice watch. And um, 
and the watch community. So, so I was interested in, in in seeing what would happen if you brought the two together, I suppose. And and so that's that's very much what Anna Dane's about. It's kind of trying new ideas and and um, and you know um, using. Yeah, working with different people. Yeah, I mean, so it's, so it sounds like it's from a, a background as a you know professional you know product designer or you know graphic design, industrial design, whatever sort of design you were doing, you've got that Dieter Rams aesthetic meets you know Breguet traditional enamel crafting. Is I, I'm interested as to I understand you know the appeal of of watches as a product, but where did that love of or that fascination with enamel come from specifically? Like, why did you decide to uh, go yeah. down to, you well, know, the arts college for an enamel of all things? Why not a watchmaker? Good, good I would, to point out, I was, I was never a professional anything as well. <laughs> maybe maybe pretending I was there. Um, but no, I've, I've never been a, a professional any of those things. I studied architecture, but then uh, didn't become an architect and then tried to do products over right there. Um, so, but anyway, f- from, from the enamel perspective i think i'd i'd been fascinated about building a watch in this in, in britain not not for any patriotic reasons just because i thought if you go to switzerland stroke china it's going to come out like everyone else's watches and i thought if you went to the uk and and you found someone who did something similar to say hands but had never done hands before then their hands would come out differently to you know whoever's making hands abroad same with the dial and the same with the case and the strap. And what you'd have at the end of it would be a watch that was different and it might not be good, but it would be different and that would be interesting. So that that was kind of the starting point. And so for the dial, coins were um, were kind of the starting point. So I, I went to see two, um, two coin mints in Birmingham and one of them had a coin. It was a commemorative coin with a, uh, an enamel poppy on it. And I just, I could still kind of uh, visualize it. It was, it was very striking. And, and I, you know, I knew there was enamel in watching, watchmaking. And, um, um, and that's how I kind of got set on that course. So, and, and actually after that, we, we did speak to some, uh, some people in Birmingham who did do enameling on, on kind of um, brooches and buttons and things like that. And we worked with them for a year or so, but the tolerances were so, vastly different um that it you know it was looking back on it it was never going to work but it did take us a good year to work out that it it wasn't you know it wasn't feasible that that's why i kind of decided to try doing it in-house very cool lots of uh, lots of lessons learned along the way mm-hmm. lewis this is felix and i's first watch collaboration at yeah. So we're going to ask you, what does a good creative partnership look like? I know you've, you know, Anna Dane has done, you know, a couple of uh, different sort of limited editions with a few different people around the world, the Armory, Worn and Wound. Uh, but what does a good creative partnership look like to to yourself and Anna Dane? Like this, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's in in um uh in all serious. I think I think there's definitely a balance where you you don't want it to be. You don't want someone to come with you and say, "I've seen this watch and I wanted to make it, but in enamel." And that's mm-hmm. um, it can be it can be a fun thing if you really like the watch, but it's. I think what happened in this situation, which I I was I liked and I think was is a good way of doing, it, is that you guys had a, a very clear idea of what you thought field watch should be, mm-hmm. and also I think you had a clear idea of what you you understood our take on the field watch to be. So then you have your position, we have ours, and then you meet in the middle. Mm-hmm. And and I think you know, we we were discussing Loom on the field watch at, at some point. And well, well, Lewis, I think you know we, before we get ahead of ourselves talking too much about the design and the di- design process, I'm really keen because this has been in the works for it's got to have been over twelve months now, Felix. Mm. Um, sort of something that's been bouncing around, uh, bouncing around the world back and forth, as you sort of mentioned. Um, we have ideas, you have ideas, but I, I honestly can't remember uh, how this how this started, Lewis. Do you, do you remember how we even came up? with the idea of doing a watch together? I remember, well, I remember going back a bit further than that, the listening to the podcast the first time. Uh-huh. And it um, it was the first episode. It's in fact the first three episodes I'd been yep. stuck Oof. in lockdown. And I know, I was, uh, and I was, I was driving out of my uh, in-law's house in the Highlands where I'd been for, for a good few weeks, back to Glasgow, completely empty roads mm. and, beautiful spring sunshine and I listened to three episodes in a go and um and I have 
you've really clear um, and happy memories of that. So um, it kind of, um, after that, I, I, cause I, I've, I knew you guys before yeah. um, a little bit. Um, and then I got in touch and I just thought it'd be a nice thing to do. Cause I, I think obviously to a lot of collaborations going around, but I, I, the, the, um, there's a nice relaxed vibe about you guys. Mm. And, and I always think that that would, so that, that'd be a good match, especially for the watch that we've done, I think, mm. because it's, it's a field watch, but it's not, it's, it's, you're not, you know, under the impression that you're kind of a, a Marine or James Bond or something. It's, it's kind of a field watch yeah. for people who don't. Yeah. It's kind of like the difference series. between like a sports watch and like the world, like it's sort of like, it's sporty, but it's not functionally sporty. Yeah. yeah. I said it's, 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 <laughs> it's the Royal Oak of Field Watches. You heard it there. It's the Royal Oak of Field Watches. Um, I, I would actually disagree with everyone there. I can very much imagine James Bond wearing this. Um, yeah. If anyone at Eon Productions uh, wants to, you're not happy with Amiga, uh, yeah. we're here. Yeah. We did sell a lot of these to get uh, get the marketing budget up, I think, Felix. I mean, you know, Sean Connery's from Scotland. And on age, yeah. it, it makes sense. We had, uh, was it Lazenby? The was Lazenby Australian? <laughs> I think he was, yeah. <laughs> I think we need to scrap it, uh, Lewis, and, um, and just immediately <laughs> rebrand it into a, a bond yeah. thing. To watch. Push production. We're going to yeah. need to make twenty thousand of these a year it's... at least. Um, okay, so yeah, so it's a field watch. Um, we've got the two dials. We've got the white dial and the pink dial. Um, mm. I think you, I like. I like to think that the two different variations came because you know when I think you started mocking up the dials, you might have even started making them. I, I couldn't decide between which path to go down. So it was, like, ah, I really like the pink, but the, the off-white's really nice. Um, and you just, you, you kind of said, yeah, you, well, why don't we do both? Yeah, I, I think I think you guys would, were, were more maybe conservative in that you wanted to sell watches or you wanted one of them to sell at least. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. you went kind of erring on the side of white. But then I think at the back of my mind, I've always wanted, since we like discussed this because of your logo, Mm. It always had to be a pink watch for me, so um, yeah. So both made sense. I mean, yeah, that's what I remember, Andy. Like we were like, oh, will, will a pink watch sell? Like, will, yeah, will people, yeah, you know, is it just us that like that? And Lewis was really, you, you went hard on it, Lewis. Like, yeah, you pushed the pink. We like, we said, okay, let's do off white with pink details, and you're like, yeah. oh, by the way, I've just made this pink one. I cool really, pink. really like it. What do you think? <laughs> let's do it. Like, I'm, didn't really I'm not as choice. I'm not as fussed as people about people buying yeah. them. Actually, just I just. <laughs> I think if I like them, that's good enough. So it's a good yeah. it's a good mindset to have, um, <laughs> and, and and it is it is funny. We were sort of we were sort of a bit cautious, but we landed on the on the two, and they both I think uh, both have some enough OT in there that you you sort of know that we were we were involved yeah. and very yeah. unordained steel. So there's the th there's thirty of each. Um, we should mention. I think the the special thing here, and you know, I was lucky enough, and and so Felix was lucky enough to have a look at some prototypes mm. uh, a little while ago now. And uh, taking these out into the sun, these are really special. I'll post a picture up to to Instagram to kind of really show off how these dials look in direct light. But it is really something unique, and I want to hear more about um, why these dials look so unique. And I, I'm I'm guessing it's the, um, the enamel. How do you make an enamel dial, and what's special about that process? That's a, that's a good question, Andy. Good question. I will address that in a second, but I should probably say about the the dial itself because mm -hmm. this is and for a collaboration. This is I wouldn't say unusual, but I think I think often with collaborations, people will say you'll get maybe in this situation it's a media mm -hmm. partner, but they, they'll say I really like this vintage watch. Could we do something like this? But yeah, you you guys obviously were aware of the model too, um, and uh, Felix has has one and had written a really lovely review on it. And um, so, so you, this was always a development of that. And and you guys came to us with a, remember the drawing that you did, which I was very impressed mm. at, actually. I yeah. think that should go on the, um, the, kind yeah. of, uh, the website because it was, it was really good. And it, it kind of brought um, like a, a very, um, a strong awareness of kind of historical field watches to our design process. And um, and then we took that and you know fiddled with it and changed it a bit. But what's come out in this watch is, I think, very much, um, you know, a collaboration. And it, it's not what our subsequent model two is going to be. So it is it is a a properly different watch rather than um, you know a different dial color on the new model two, which um, which I think is nice. Yeah, and I I I really agree because we are you know. 
I understand what you're saying, Lewis, about putting that uh, that you know really bad Photoshop sketch up. But maybe hey, I don't know if we hey. will. No, it was a sketch. It was a sketch. Was a it was a sketch. Yeah, that was, yeah, yeah, it was good. I mean, yeah. I genuinely mean it was um, it was impressive actually. Uh, yeah, and because that was a, the the original idea we had was to sort of do a, a California dial style, mm-hmm. and in the end we couldn't make it work with with the, the you know Anodyne's very sort of unique typefacing. It just didn't look quite right, so mm. we ended up sort of flipping to the um, uh, the other uh, this this current style, and I, I I do love it. That's something that I'm very very excited about after seeing the prototypes, like you said, Andy. That this is a bigger mm. 39 millimeter case. Mm. Um, I think it's a f- this is the first model yes. in that size. Yes, yes, uh, debuting the 39. Yeah. yeah, very cool. And the new hands as well. The hands mm-hmm. are very special. Um, they are um, something we've worked on for a long time. This is the first time they've they've come out. So it's it's nice to be able to kind of show those off as well. Well, before we get into the hands, I want you to tell the, me what's special the about the enamel, Lewis. Yeah. Yeah, the, well, enameling in general perhaps mm-hmm. is, um, is a good place to start. Um, so there's enamel, a proper enamel, um, which is either called grand fur or vitreous enamel. It's, it's the same thing, is when you take um, powdered glass, Mm-hmm. And um, and melt it in a kiln onto a metal surface, and so you you generally take um, copper or silver, and you 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 put six or seven layers of enamel on the top and um, one on the back, uh, and the I suppose the challenge with that is that you have to. Um, you're putting it in a, something very delicate that's that's less than a millimeter thick when it's finished, in a in a kiln and heating it up to eight or nine hundred degrees centigrade, and then cooling it down and then repeating that you know, any you know, seven or eight times even and you've, you know it, it warps and it cracks and things like that and you have to stop it from doing that and it's it's a funny thing because it's it's a very very kind of handmade process, but the tolerances that you're talking about for the end products are tolerances that you get from, from machining something you know, it has, it has to be perfectly flat and the feet have to be exactly the right position and there has to be no imperfections and it has to fit in a watch case. So you're, you're getting a kind of very artisanal process and, and getting it to the skill level where you could make it uh, as something that's been, you know, made on a CNC lathe. So that that's the challenge. That's that's why it takes such a long time. But in terms of the qualities of enamel, um, I was say if if you look at a stained glass window in a you know in a Norman church or something that's that's a thousand years old, and that's been sitting up in the sun for a thousand years, and the colours are still vivid. That's you know if that had been a painting or you know a printed something, it would have faded long ago. But that, that that's you know. Glass is um, in enamel and glass are the same thing, and that dial will never will never fade, um, and it'll and even um, it sort of has this intensity and this this rendering of color that you just you don't get with any other um, you know with painting or any other medium. Mm-hmm. Which, and it's it's very it's very addictive. I think when you start working with enamel, it's it's very difficult to go work with other in other kind of mediums. Because it just it just doesn't seem as good, I think. But it mm. is also incredibly. It's a challenge for us because I mean we we are. Uh, it's it's production quantities are, are tiny, you know, relative to to other companies. So, and yeah. and and it must be so much more. Um, well, it's not. It must be. It is so much more. Um, you know, labor intensive, resource intensive than you know a traditional sort of stamped dial. What mm. sort of you know failure rate do you look at with enamel? dials like i assume it's a lot higher than than other sort of techniques. it is high it is high it's an interesting question actually felix because i think a lot of what you learn about enamel in watchmaking comes from marketing departments mm. so you'll and uh, and that that kind of filter is it, it's funny a lot of you always hear the swiss companies saying that they've got like 80 percent failure rates or whatever um, we we do it in a different way. So we, we we do have a high failure rate, and it, it is 
you know, you might make two or three, four dials and, and one will be good. But mm-hmm. we tend to focus on one dial. So you'll get an Amla working on the one dial and it'll take a day or two days to, to get that perfect. Um, but if there are issues with it, if it starts to warp, then they'll they'll jump in and you know and fix that. Whereas it's not a case of you just put 20 in the oven and you get two out or something like that. Mm-hmm. So I think the, tr- the the kind of the conventional wisdom on, on failure rates to enamel is perhaps more of a, kind of a product of marketing rather than, um, uh, yeah. you know, the, the kind of, in fact. The reality. Well, mm. you, I mean, analyzers achieve some incredible color and texture. Um, you know, take the example of the fume uh, enamel that you guys do. Yeah. What's involved in sort of developing these new techniques and looks to the dials? That, I mean, the Fume was an interesting one. I, it's, this is something I always go on about is is the, the kind of benefits of having the design team and the manufacturing team in the same place because the Fume came back as an accident. Um, we were experimenting with silver as a base ma- material rather than copper and it reacts differently to copper. So one of the early ones, we were using a, a transparent enamel on silver and the, you know it warped very badly so that the middle of the dial came up and the sides went down. But what happened is that when when it was polished and the surface was was um, kind of polished back, you had this very light part in the middle and very dark part in the outsides because there was more enamel in the outsides between the silver base and the surface and less in the middle. Mm-hmm. And it's a lovely effect. And we thought, well, if you could make a dial that was formed so that it was flat on the bottom and it had a little dome in the middle and it could be... Um, enameled so that it was perfectly flat when it came out, then you would have this this kind of you would be able to control this effect, and um, and so that's how the the Fumé technique came about, and that was that was the first time anyone has done that with enamel in that way. Um, I think um, AP have a have a Fumé enamel dial which is which is made using with two different enamels that are kind of mixed together. It's all radiated, but it's it's. Um, I think that was the first, uh, which was which is fun because if we hadn't, you know, if if we'd been working with enamel in a different location, and we we'd asked for you know silver dial with with um kind of uh, blue transparent enamel on top, and that had happened, he would have chucked it away. But as we were there to kind of you know everyone's looking at this thing, you can see the the possibilities. So um, uh, yeah, a lot of it is just experimenting and and failures and things like that. I, I guess that's the advantage of uh, of doing it for yourself. You can sort of learn along the way. That's um, yeah, it's... very cool. You mentioned a little while ago um, when we were talking about uh, the OT watch coming out uh, that the hands were special. Uh, why? They are, yeah, they're, they're my favourite part of the watch, I think, actually, in, in you know, all the, the Model 2s. Um, they're, they, they, the, the, the original Model 2 hands, the idea behind them was that you had, um, if you imagine your hand is holding a pen, you've kind of got your, your thumb and your forefinger pinching mm-hmm. a pen and then the pen running through the middle. That was that was the kind of concept for the hands that you had these these two parts of the hand pinching the loom stick. And um, and we th- we did those for the first model to using, um, using a Swiss company to stamp them because they were the, the, the distance between the different parts of the hands was incredibly fine. So that was quite challenging. And then we got another Swiss company to loom them because they were, it was a, a really precise bit of um, kind of microscope looming that was needed. Um, but for this one, we started making hands ourselves. So we started working on some of the processes like the staking and the bluing in-house. And we wanted to bring some of that in. So we, we changed the design slightly and we made them out of steel. And then blew them in house, and then sent them back to the the kind of detailed Swiss um, looming company. So they're they're heat blued hands with um, with loom on top, and um, and I they, they might they might I mean there might be hands out there like that, but I haven't come across that before. And I I realised the reason for that is that when you heat blue hands, if you mess it up, mm-hmm. you can just if you scratch them when you're putting them on, for example, you can just repolish them and reheat them and, and recycle them. Um, but when you've got loom on top, you can't do that. So it is um, it it does 
make a kind of a, for a quite a high failure rate. But it, they are lovely looking things. I think I love that it's your your favorite part because the hands are the hands are really nice and they sort of add another layer of detail and excitement to these enamel dials. Mm. Uh, now, Anodyne is famously Glasgow based. Yeah. But what work do you do in Las Vegas? Uh, what's the local <laughs> capacity, and, and what sort of help do you get from third-party suppliers? It's funny. This there's a lot of um, in Britain. There's a lot of kind of first made about made in the UK and stuff like uh-huh. that from a from a um, kind of patriotic perspective. And I um, have never really been one for that. I, I always think that it's it's who you work with rather than where they're based. But mm-hmm. but we do do a lot here, and it, it's purely because of the amount of control um, that you get over over the processes. So. Obviously, we we do the we do the enameling here. Um, we are we've just invested in in a big machine for for making some of the blanks, which we were previously doing in, in Birmingham. But the, the chap doing it has is, is retiring, so we we're, we're having to kind of take that in house. Um, the hand making um, we are doing. We've done actually the the that we made a pair of gold hands for that. Um, Pink dial project mm. and that was the first time we made the entire thing and we'd formed the hands as well that was our first completely um in-house hand but the hands we make at the moment are, are kind of blued and polished and staked in-house and um also we do the assembly and the regulation in-house and um and all of the development stuff so so the only things which are the things which are outside of the cases the movements the straps um and and we are actually we've got one of the watchmakers um, nice is um, is has been working on a on a module for the six four nine eight for the past year so we've got we're we're starting to get into um, kind of not movement making in its in its entirety but mm-hmm. um, into kind of modifying movements and decorating and things like that so there's the team is there's about ten or eleven. Of, of the kind of makers of between watchmakers and enamelers and um you know a couple of people in kind of engineering and, and design that that work alongside them so it, it's it's a fairly um i think fairly capable now and that's like in stark contrast to like four years ago when it was yeah. gonna um yeah we were we had no idea really about most of that stuff um, learning quickly. Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing that's sort of striking, um, you know, since you know four years ago, uh, is just the sort of the explosion of of popularity of of not just Anodyne but of this sort of sector of you know artisanal mm. watchmaking um, generally. And, and one thing I'd be interested to to talk to you about is how you've coped with that, uh, especially in sort of moving towards different production methods. Yes, I mean that that is a very topical question at the moment, Felix. It's um is we our our method of production before had been you know, someone would order a watch and we would make it for them. And initially that that was a fairly quick thing. Yeah. And then as more people ordered, it, it the waiting time got longer and, and what we found earlier this year was that especially with COVID and people you know, having to isolate and and all these kind of unexpected interruptions to the to the production process, it was causing. You know, we were getting way behind. Um, we weren't having any time to develop anything, which was which is upsetting me. And um, and everyone was getting very very stressed. So we kind of came up with the idea of stopping taking orders, getting on top of all the orders we had, sending them out, and then really planning the future. So we, we'd say the next month we're going to spend three weeks on production and one week on development. And at the end of that month, we'll put everything we've made on sale and people can buy it or, mm-hmm. you know, or wait till, you know, the month after. So that, that we've been doing that for two months now. And from an internal point of view, it's, it's, it's brilliant because it gives us, I mean, anyone who's talked to me by email and asked when something's coming out, I've, I've not deliberately, but always, always been wrong. I've always said it'd be a couple of months and it's, it's, you know, it just never comes out because we're always chasing, you know, orders. I'm trying to um, keep on top of that. Um, I mean, the good news is uh, here, Lewis, you've started production 
on the OT. I have, so. yes. No, it wasn't. Yeah, you guys are fine. Don't worry. So, but, so um, how will it work yeah. for for the um, the limited edition sixty that we're doing? Well, we're making we're making five a month of okay. each. So that that's kind of been scheduled in, and that's that's the lovely thing about the system is that you can say um, we we've got this X amount of capacity, and we're gonna. You know, allocate this to this project and that to that watch but i mean the issue that we found is that the past two months we've had an increasing amount of customers have been very upset with the process because they've mm-hmm. been expecting to get a watch on the first month and you know this is kind of frenzy that's whipped up by the by the process and although it does work very well for us i do think that kind of annoying your customers every month is is not a good way of um of kind of running a business so we are working out how we can kind of change the process to, to keep some of the organizational aspect for us but also make it less frustrating mm-hmm. for the customer so so that is going to change soon um but right. i'm not exactly sure how but yeah in terms of our watch um we are making five of each a month and yep and we've um, already started the, so a couple yeah. of months a couple of months that will be done uh they're going to be on sale hopefully as you listen to this. As you're listening to yeah. this. Uh, so just a reminder, there is 30 of each dial. Uh, they're going to probably sell pretty quickly and you're not going to have to wait too long, which is, you know, all yeah, positive. Yeah, like, I mean, say you get watch 60 out of 60, you're looking early next year, you know? Yeah, not too bad. Yeah. Not too bad. Not too bad at all. And it's an it's exciting. And I, I can sort of sympathize with you, uh, Lewis, sort of the – this unprecedented demand uh, and the the impacts that that all you know have on a small manufacturer and it's it's cool to hear you know that you're not making that many that that many watches you know sort of peeling off ten for ten for us is is very kind and you know it it, it is nice to work with a smaller you know smaller brand um, and I think part of the reason these you know brands like Anodana are getting more popular is because you do get um, you're closer to the brand and to the people making the watches and and to the story of it. And I think that that's a little bit more appealing to, um, to a lot of the, the watch community, especially sort of coming out of, of lockdown. Um, mm. What we should talk about uh, is the price. So from memory, uh, the retail price is going to be 1250 sterling, great British pounds uh, plus yes. fat. So Felix, that's what, 2300 Aussie? Yeah, or about, uh, depending on your currency exchange rate and the day, around 16 and a half uh, US. Bargain, absolute bargain. Yeah, a bit. I mean, we should buy two. I, I, I'm really interested, Lewis. Why is it so much of a bargain? Um, was, we we started off um, selling them too cheaply. I think to be, to be honest, <laughs> um, that's just how. Um, and I don't like putting the price up, but it is. It's different. We so enameling is obviously we've talked about this. You can get one skilled person can make one dial a day, basically, and that that is um, that should be leading to an expensive watch but i think the we spent a, a long time and a, and a kind of a lot of money setting this up so we've got the the experience and the equipment here and once you're up and going it's you know we're, we're not buying them in from manufacturing in switzerland so you haven't got those huge overheads mm. um you know the cost of living here is is a lot less than switzerland if you've mm-hmm. ever kind of bought a sandwich in basel you'll, <laughs> you'll know that and um <laughs> so it's it it is um, yeah, it's, it's tricky. We we do have low margins, and I think that that is an issue. But we've always been busy, you know. From from right from when we launched, we had we had a kind of backlog. So it's not we've kind of been busy and not making. You know, we're not we're not making lots of money, but we're we're kind of we're surviving and we're comfortable. So it's yeah, it's not something we're kind of complaining about. But but they are. I think do you recognize the fact they are kind of under underpriced. Um, well, I mean, I mean, the, the, and I'm glad, you know, for for sort of selfish reasons and for for you yeah. know the, the listeners that that's that the price that it is is accessible for this watch. But are you sort of tempted, or are there any plans in the future to to go up market to you know put maybe a a fancier movement in there and add a zero to the price? Um, I think movements are an interesting one because I, I, you know, as you guys have known over the past I don't know, ten years or so, there's been this big fascination with in-house movements mm-hmm. and. I you know, and I was caught up by a lot of that. So I, I spent a lot of time in Switzerland talking to people and, and seeing how could we do something like that. Um, but and I, the, the feedback you get from people who actually work in movement manufacture is that you know 
in-house movements are, are often made by the same people as off-the-shelf movements and kind of rebranded. And even in, in that situation, they are generally less reliable and you know, harder to um, to find parts for. And there's, apart from the aesthetics um, and the kind of, the sort of, um, the prestige that comes movement. with it. Yeah, yeah, exactly, the prestige. And the, um, there's, there's really no advantage of having them. So I think where we're going with movements is trying to find a way of, of taking reliable kind of affordable movements and and make them beautiful and that that's mm-hmm. a project that we've been on for for a good while so i mean i'm hoping something will come out of that next year um and a big part of that is not wanting to jack the price up so I, I don't want to sell watches that are inaccessible to most people um i think there are certain things like the model three we have been working on for probably three years now um and that's using a technique called champ levé so we're we're and those watches are are painfully difficult to make because you're 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 bringing the silver uh through the enamel so instead of printing yeah you've mm. got the silver base is coming through the enamel to the top and it's a it's a phenomenal technique because it means you can create very simple designs that if they were printed they would look kind of boring and unfinished but because they've got this this the silver, which will catch your eye in certain lights, um, they just look fantastic. But but a, a Champlevé dial can, well, I mean, once you've spent the the months and months developing it, it can take a week to make one of those. So, so I mean that that would just prevent you from selling them at these prices. And I, I think it would be nice to be able to showcase those things. And if if anyone buys them, then that's that's great. But um, I think there will be a time where we, you know, if we, if we're going to do those watches, we would have to you know put the increase the price to. To sort of justify the time, I think, but but generally, I I I don't want to, you know, have, I I have no interest in putting up the price. You like where you're at, kind of prestige. You like where you're at. Well, that's interesting. It's it's and it, and it's really cool to see um, this sort of level of of, of dial, you know, at a an entry, um, you know, mm. from a from a micro brand, um, and hopefully we see that the 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 business grow and production grow, but it's also I think totally fine to be kind of doing your thing and staying, you know, true to true to the initial roots. All right, so let's recap on this watch quickly. It's, it's, so it's a new case size debuting in at 39 millimeters for the Model 2. So that's a couple of millimeters bigger than the one that Felix has, Yep. Um, which is which is cool. So it's got a little bit more presence. Uh, it has those new hands. Uh, it does have, we should mention, an engraved case back. So uh, there's a bit of topography uh, on the back with um, of, of Victoria, where Felix and I reside. So mm-hmm. sort of a, a little Aussie Aussie touch in there, uh, and the sort of a grid treatment to it as well, which which looks lovely. Uh, and of course, these two dials. So sort of an off white, and uh, I don't know what we would how we would describe the pink. I call it um, Homer Simpson donut pink. Homer Simpson donut pink is pretty accurate. Uh, I think everyone has has a visual image. There's thirty of each. Production has started, uh, and it's going to be a little bit of a uh, little bit of a trickle to get them out to people. But I don't uh, I, I I don't think that's going to be an issue when you get it because having uh, having one in front of me right now it's it's going to be worth the wait. Uh, and the price is twelve fifty great British pounds, uh, in, with that on top. So. Yeah, uh, all in all, a great package, Felix. I am very excited, but you're not even more excited for. What are you excited for, Andy? The future of Anal Day. And Lewis, what, what's, what does the future hold? Where, where are we going to see the brand in 2022? Well, um, hopefully with less COVID, that would be nice. Because that's <laughs> my current headache is people getting COVID. But um, yeah. no, the, the, the exciting thing, I think, coming up, um, apart from just generally growing and, and you know, developing new projects, is we have just submitted planning for a factory. So we, we, we bought some land in Glasgow and cool. um, we're building a factory on it uh, with, with a, actually the, one of the, my old tutors at architecture school is, is a, is a brilliant architect um, a guy called Neil Gillespie. And he's, he's designed this, um, this factory, which will kind of, it's, it's just purpose built for, for our processes and will allow us to bring in things like um, CNC machines and um, to, to get into, kind of more more of the manufacturing like cases and kind of movement customization so um yeah that that's that's the exciting well one of the exciting things that's and, coming up now lewis i don't want to um uh you know correct you here but i, I believe you can't if it's a watch <laughs> facility you can't yeah. call it a factory it's it's either it's a, ma- a, it's a maison of, or a manufacturer <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, the, name yeah i know it's um that's um that's oh, wow. a deliberate thing actually the the enamelers started calling it the factory, and I just thought that's that's 
yeah, I couldn't couldn't bring myself to call it a manufacturer in Glasgow. No, so I, I, think we're gonna, I, I think that would be um, part of the part of the Glaswegian charm. I, I think yeah, everyone wants to work in a factory, so that's that's <laughs> that's fine. But um, yeah. um, oh, and I should um, on the on the specs of the watch, I meant to say that it's, there's a five year warranty, like with oh, amazing with all all the watches, and and obviously they get there's there's four watchmakers here so anything that needs servicing or fixing just comes back and uh, <clears throat> one thing i i realize that we haven't talked about at all uh that mm. i think is a really key part of an ordain and also uh specifically the model two is the role um and you, you reminded me andy talking about the case back with that map engraving mm -hmm. is that sort of inspiration of the ordnance survey maps and your typography which i think you know there's, yeah, there's hardly yeah. a brand name on the dial but you know the the combination of the enamel and that beautiful beautiful font um really stands out so you have an in-house typographer which just seems like an odd hire it's a funny one it's actually it was our <laughs> second hire as well so it was, uh, we were not getting we weren't hiring kind of sales and marketing people we did yeah. typographers in um but yeah imogen is, is fantastic i'm um i'm a huge fan of her and um she's she, we we first met when she was just graduating from the art school and kind of getting into typography and and that was kind of her her vocation really and she's she's been um she's been doing a lot of work if you're ever in Glasgow and you see the, the the posters for the GI festival that's that's her stuff there and you, you kind of recognize it other places as well but um yeah I, th I think typography has become a really big part and mm -hmm. when when we started looking at the aesthetics I mean we always knew it was we wanted to use enamel and we wanted to use kind of design that we liked but we had the name Anodane which was there um but we didn't have anything else so, so Imogen started looking at kind of maps of of the area where kind of the lock Anodane is is situated and and we got all these old OS maps dating back to mm -hmm. the late um, late 1800s I think and um and really and and that was kind of where where the the model one and the logo came from and um it's just it's just a lovely it's a, it's a luxury yeah. really having that there and being able to everything you can kind of come up with your own font for or, um, well it was part of the yeah. process as well it made it really yeah. sort of interesting for us because we were kind of like oh well, what would this look like and you're like ah, don't worry Imogen will we'll whip this up and we can up, mock yeah. this up and yeah. uh, it was it was actually really cool um how and experiencing how like hands-on uh experiencing first hand I should say how hands-on uh yourself and the team is and sort of yeah, you might not be a massive business, but you have you seem to have the right mix of people to get things done really quickly. Like, you know, changes to the case back, tweaks to things, uh, changes to dial design, hands, and you know, there's a lot of you know yeah, third parties was... involved. But you're able to kind of whip things up, and that was a really exciting part of the process because Felix and I learned a lot about you know some things take longer. And for me, and I sort of said this to someone else recently, it was sort of the things I thought would take a really long time were the quickest and the things that I thought would be the quickest took the longest. And it, it's, it's sort of fascinating. It is. Uh, and I would, it, it is probably an anomaly, I think in, in terms of watch companies that we're not, um, we're not set up the same way as other people. And not, not that it's a good or a bad thing. It's just, it's just the way we've kind of um, mm. developed in, in isolation, I suppose it's, is that because, because we started off wanting to make the dials ourselves, you can't go off to a, what what you normally do if you're starting a watch company, you go to a white label company and say, "I've got this idea for a watch. Can you can you make it?" And they would then deal with all the different people at factories to make cases and hands and movements or whatnot. But we had to go direct to those factories because we didn't have that middleman. And so so it has very much changed how we operate as a business. And yeah. you know the uh, and it 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 works really nicely. And, and and that actually is another thing which which adds to the value aspect in terms of pricing is that you're cutting mm. out. The kind of white label guys yeah but it's yeah it does it, i think from kind of years of, of frustration that, that that the the um the time for developing things has has shrunk a lot just mm. by you know yeah by well i think i sort in. of i answered my own next question um which was the <laughs> the sort of my favorite parts of this process uh around the collaboration but Lewis, I would love to hear what your favourite part of this collab has been, and then Felix, you can follow up. Mm. I, I, I like the Zoom meetings. Actually, it's weird, um, but <laughs> I, I particularly like the one where it was 
morning as it is now for me and yeah. and then you you're sitting there with a large glass of something <laughs> brown it, and it the watch the on your thing. wrist yeah and <laughs> it was that was a really nice thing because we'd made this obviously a very very clever yeah. process and then it had turned up in australia um after a few days in the post and it was then on your wrist <laughs> with a glass of whiskey and it was it was just it was just really nice it was i think it was a yeah it's, it's good a bit of a bit, that, that, a bit of been scotch whiskey andy Definitely yeah. <laughs> a large glass, yeah. And I think for me, like it's it's um, sort of similar to Andy, um, but but a slightly you know different take on it. Like I've spent so you know professionally, like years and years of my life, like talking about these watches and mm. and coming at them from a very uh, you know a well informed, I think, consumer mm. point of view. Like I understand more than you know maybe some people about how Swiss factories work and all that sort of stuff. But I, I never, uh, you know, thought that that we would um, or that I would be involved in making a watch. You know, mm. I know that there's a lot of, you know, it's a big sort of trend with media companies or, you know, making making limited editions and that makes a lot of sense. But I don't. I think we got in touch with you, Lewis, just because we wanted to sort of have you as a guest on the podcast. Yeah, and we finally did it. We had to make a watch with you to get it to get yeah, that. Yeah, well, that was the first chat. That was right. And it, that was the first chat. That was that was weird because it was like it was like talking to a, the podcast. It was it yeah. was surreal because I was in the van at the time as well, and I was I was talking to you guys, and it was like I was listening to the podcast, and then talking to myself. It was. It was um, unnerving that that first chat. I think. Yeah, and and but, I, um, I, it's not something that we sort of. Or I'm just speaking for myself. It's not something that I'd considered or no. uh, yeah. sought yeah. out. But like with with you, it makes really good sense because I, I really do love that model too, and I really like you know your approach and your mm. your aesthetic. But seeing seeing it come together has been really really cool and occasionally frustrating. You know, not not for fault of yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Let's blame the global oh. supply so, chain. Some of the fault of me. <laughs> No, I mean, like it's a weird right. time to collaborate on anything, but it's a, um, it is. Yeah, I should. I want like, and to that point, Felix, I think how personal it has been because it's sort of because yeah, you know, it's not you know going through the hoops of a you know conglomerate um, mm. brand. It's been very personal. So we hop on a Zoom, um, you know, with yourself and maybe one or two others from the team, but you know, mostly it's 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 yourself. Or we're in a WhatsApp and we're sort of taking photos or videos and sending things back and forth, and you know, forwarding messages. And it's been very terrible very sketches. Personal. Yeah, <laughs> and it, exactly. Wow, well, they're not terrible. Um, but, and it's for me, it's sort of to kind of feel so close to the creation of something. And you know, when I'm making it, when I'm you know, designing it by any means, but sort of just to have some input on a physical product when we live in this sort of digital space. Um, where you know it's it's an audio file or it's a photo or it's you know a word document to have something mm. physical that we've been involved with that you know you can kind of pass down or or see your friends wear or or you know give to someone at some point is is I think really quite special Felix. Yeah, and I think you've just yeah, um, I'm not disagreeing with you at all, Andy. Um, yeah, I don't have anything to say. But the other thing that um, you mentioned it before, Lewis, and I really like it as well, is I think this is a good collaboration because we do kind of come from very different places. Like I'm mm. super nerdy, mm-hmm. you know, about watches and, you know, I really can like dig into the history of military watches and what is a field mm-hmm. watch and all that sort of stuff. Whereas you come from a you know, designing quite contemporary, beautiful a less knowledgeable product. base. No, no, no. Yeah. Like, like it's not. No, no. It is. It is. I, I enjoyed this, especially because I, you know, I was learning stuff as well. So but, but yeah, like I mean, we could have, you know, the other way of doing this would be to, to try and recreate some, you know, authentic military style yeah. piece from the sixties. But I just don't think that's fun. It's, and it's certainly no. not. It's certainly not OT. No. I don't would think. Would have been a drain. Mm. <laughs> I um. Uh, so the, the question I have is: is which one are you guys going to go for? I'm taking both. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, for both. that's chickening out the question. I, I think I'll wear the the off white tie more. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, but personally, I'm a, I'm a sucker for a pale dial, and mm-hmm. I'm not saying that I went to all this effort to get a watch made so I could have my perfect <laughs> watch color. But I'm also not not. But it comes that. into it, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I genuinely having them both side by side and, and having them for a fair bit of time. I struggle uh, because the, the, they are such a good pair, 
and every now and then you sort of you know you see a, a release of of watches that look really well together. I know I'm, I'm biased, um, <laughs> but the last time this happened was with the um, what was it the those Nomos the the grey and the orange one, Felix. Mm. Um, just, you know, talking about another brand for a second that. I had the same predicament of like, these just go so well together. And I know you're not going to wear two on one wrist or one on each wrist, but just sort of seeing them as a, as a pair, um, as a set, it worked really well for me. But what about you, Lewis? What what are you taking? I'd always, I mean, the only reason I ever did this was to get another pink watch. (laughs) (laughs) You you were pushing the pink pretty hard from the start. I've always always liked it. Um, But no, I I like them both. I just, yeah. I just thought that I think the pink's a bit more fun, which um, yeah, it but is they a lot both they they both come out nicely, and I, I think f- from my perspective, having a bigger dial like that was a little bit, um, you know, it's a bit strange to start with because it felt a little bit empty, but just because I'm so used to making the the small model too. Um, mm-hmm. But once it's all finished and everything's put together, it is it is a lovely watch, and um, and I definitely. I think it definitely go with the pink. So. Speaking of, you've yeah. uh, you've just reminded me of something else we haven't mentioned um, because it mm. is a bigger dial and there's a different mm. dial layout. There's less text on there. Yep. But mm. we've made up for it by adding uh, a 60 second or 60 minute track around there too, which sort of mm. uh, adds a yeah, little nice uh, adds a little technical vibe. And that's yeah, another thing. This larger size has a seconds hand, mm. whereas uh, yeah, I think didn't. I think that. That's no. It's there. Are, there are a few changes on on the um, on the first first model two coming through this. So it, and, and a lot of that is is feedback from people and um, mm-hmm. um, so yeah. I, I think it should be. Hopefully, it'll be it'll be well received. Yeah, I think so. And if you've slept on this episode over the weekend and you've missed out, uh, that's your fault, guys. <laughs> Well, uh, you well, know, I, get them off I, Chrono 24 for a ridiculous market. <laughs> yeah, twenty times retail. <laughs> Dear me. Um, uh, well, uh, Lewis, I think we've got to, you know, let you go start your day and maybe, you know, churn mm. out some more pink dials. Uh, but as a one of the very OG listeners, back when we had terrible mm. audio quality, you will know <laughs> what the next question is. I do, I do. Well, um, do you want to ask yourself the question and answer it? I, well, I, was, I thought I might get a pass because I've, I've got three small children and I, I can't really have hobbies with children. Peppa Pig. Do. Peppa Pig's um, great. Peppa Pig is yeah. Louis. No, I do. Um, I actually don't. Uh, things like that. That's something I get very into because I, I, I find it's a nice, it's a nice break because you get very into work. You get. Well, I, I certainly get kind of very involved with stuff, and then to have something else to get, you know, absorbed with, um, is a really good way of keeping interested with um, your kind of day job. So I, um, I tend to get into these things like. Um, Curing meat was one like making mm-hmm. uh, charcuterie was something I got really into last year. But at the moment we're um, we're building a little we've we've bought a little farm in the Highlands and we're building a house. So ar- architecture is something that I've got back into a lot. And, I love that. Um, yeah, the person I was uh, found who I, I I really really love at the moment is is um, a lady called Wench Selma, who's a Norwegian architect from the kind of mid century. But I was thinking about this before. She's very hard to. There's only one book on it, and it doesn't need to be published anywhere. So she's she's kind of but if if you're if you're keen on digging out PDFs, Wench Selma mm-hmm. is a brilliant person to look at. But actually, um, Glenn Merkett would be someone I'd recommend to look at because he's Australian and he's um, also a brilliant architect. Nice. Um, do you guys uh, would you know of him as Australian? Yes. Or, yeah, 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 you do. Yeah, in, yeah. In Melbourne, yeah. Yeah, he's he. I mean, amazing houses. They don't really translate to colder climates, but mm. they are. He's always one of my kind of idols as I was when I was studying architecture. Well, uh, maybe yeah. in a few years' time, we can you can get an annual date on Kevin McLeod's wrist as he as he uh, does a tour of your. <laughs> He's your over farm there, house. is he? Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry about it. that. Um, yeah, well, thanks very much for having me, guys. It's nice. nice no, thank you, honestly Absolute and sincerely. Uh, it's been incredible. Yeah, it's been awesome. Right. Well, see if anyone buys any of the watches, eh? <laughs> Fingers <Okay>. crossed. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thanks so much, Lewis. Cool. Cheers, guys. Felix, uh, amazing. Amazing to talk to Lewis, hear more about the brand and kind of re uh, relive the early, you know, weeks and months of this collaboration. So thank you, Anna Dane. Uh, thank you, Lewis, for taking a chance on Thank on you, us. Ewan, as well, I think. I yeah, think Ewan as well. What a guy. Like, uh, he's, really important. He's the, um, the, what do you say, like the guy that got stuff done. Like he I don't was, know what like, his title, I don't know what Ewan's title is, but he, to me it felt like he was just like the ops manager. Like yeah, I think he is the ops manager. I think, yeah, that's, I think that's his title. Uh, and if, if he's if not, not, Lewis, promote him. 
promote you. And he um he was amazing. Uh, the whole team at Annaldale was amazing. It's really cool to be in a position yeah. to and, work with them. And like we've said, Andy, I think it's just it's a real it's a real treat and an honor to sort of be able to to do something like this. Not something mm. I ever really uh, expected, you know, uh, or, or really was looking for, but. I'm really glad we did. I mean, we've we've been sending each other messages. We've got the official picks uh, mm. early, and we're just saying I've got one how, on my wrist. How 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 great it is, and how yeah. happy we are with it. So and yeah, you know what, Felix? Mm. If this came to a surprise to any listeners, as a surprise to some listeners, you should have been in our Discord because we've been teasing it for weeks now. So uh, mm. another reminder: join our Discord. Make sure you hit our socials up, ot.podcast. If you want to buy the watch, Anil Dane's website is where it's going to be at. Yep. Uh, email us to tell us how much you love this uh, this new model too, ot.podcast at gmail.com. And, uh, yeah, we, want it. we look forward. We're really excited to you know, see the Get it out there. people's wrists. I can't wait to you know, be tagged in a wrist shot. Yeah, and thank you for all your support, everyone listening. It's great. Yeah, could not have done it without you. We should go. Yeah, let's do that. Uh,